So on this podcast, we use strong language sometimes when we feel like it. And if that doesn't suit you, then, you know, it doesn't suit you. Greetings, people of the Reef Beef and Reef Aquarium world. My name is Rich. And my name is Ben. This is the Reef Beef Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about, you know, what's going on. We're going to catch up with what Reef, Rich and Ben are doing in the reef keeping world. And then we have a special guest. Matt Wandell is going to be on to talk to us about Matt Wandell's stuff. So uh, there you go. Hey, Ben. Hey, Richard. Ben, what is going on in your reef keeping world, baby? Oh, I can think of one thing. I, I recently have thing? a... Do you do this for a living? You're a professional for 50 years. You know the show's coming up, and you know one thing you think just, of. Just, just one, one thing. One thing. Just one thing. No, so I have a, a strangely patterned tridacna squamosa in a client's tank, and I go in one day, and it's not pinched mantle, but it's drawn in. And mm -hmm. I'm like, don't you do that, you son of a bitch. Don't you do that. And I've been keeping tridacna since the 90s. I have a lot of experience with them. And maybe I at was, the Houston Zoo, maybe when you were working there, or no way. No. I used to work with Zog in the Neanderthal times. Oh fucking Zog. Zog! Zog could keep a fucking clam. Hey Zog, Ungawa, but uh, he only he knows what it means. But uh, no, so I was thinking like this is sort of old school, but I was like, dude, could would it maybe be pyramid snails? I heard recently James Father he called them pyram snails, pyram. But uh, and I turned that son of a bitch over, and guess what? Pyramid snails, little tiny, pokey snails that go on the underneath of a tridacna and suck its blood like a tick, sort of. Yeah, they're nasty, man. And not too long ago, uh, Mark Levinson had this event called Markna, and he had a bunch of speakers. And me and James Fothery are friends. James Fothery wrote a book, a, a couple books on tridacnid clams. And I want to I want to uh, put that link in the show notes where you can get his book on Amazon. And uh, I found I learned something from James that I didn't know is that um, is that tridacnas can tolerate full freshwater dips for even for a long time, um, even an hour, even I think he had said in his talk, someone had accidentally left them in a bucket of freshwater for a day and they were fine. Um, I'd be a little squeamish to try that. But um, that's what I did. Now I spoke to, I put that on Facebook and I, and then James and I went back and forth and really you could just take that and just brush it with a toothbrush. And then Matt, him, Matt Wandell even said, like, if you could do that several days consecutively and just, cause that's where they're going to go. And if you knock them off, you're eventually going to get to where they're gone. Um, I did dip it in fresh water and they just flew right off of the clam. So that was good for me, but now I got to go back next Monday and see, did he make it? Please, please, please. Yeah, it's. I'm surprised you didn't know about clams and fresh water. That's a whole thing. You didn't know that one. I love I love that there's shit we don't know. Yep. Um, except that one. That one, I think you're dumb for not knowing. Yeah, totally. I Fucking totally idiot. Judging you. Um, Out of the loop. As a person, not just a reef keeper. <laughs> the Richard, I've been keeping course for a long time, and I just found out they're photosynthetic. Yeah. Zog is uh, rolling over in his uh, pile of dirt that he yeah. He the, didn't even he had, wasn't even around for the invention of the wheel. Um, you know that. I think that that points out the key about parasites. Uh, is repeated action. You can't just generally you can't just do one thing and think it's going to be fixed uh, and pyramids are a pain in the ass man we used to have them sometimes at steinart and you know uh once a week for a couple of months we would go in and flip them and and pull them off and then two months would go by and we'd do it again because we had a lot of clams and it was a huge exhibit and they can also eat other snails so they're not just on clams huh. so check if if you got a clam that you can flip uh, check it out once in a while to make sure nothing crazy is going on. If you got oh. a clam that's attached, it's going to be a lot harder for you to find them. You know, that that made me that made me think what you just said. I could have accidentally introduced them off of some snails. Yeah, it's possible. I would want 
before people freak out about checking snails, freaking out about snails, first of all, always check your snails for parasites. You know, it's it'll take you five minutes. It's not that hard. Um, but uh, um, let's ask James or see if we can get James on here uh, in the near future and uh, talk about that in particular, because I think that's a that's something that he would know about. Yes. So there. No, certainly you have something going on with your stuff. I got a bunch of shit going on. Um, let's see. I, I am doing some experiments with uh, alkalinity uh, and what it takes to bring it back up over time or not over time, right? Um, I think I might put something together on that because I have enough graphs that are interesting. Um, but the main thing going on is uh, behind me here and what I've been working on is uh, the spawning is coming up. Coral's doing it. Um, the video, well, we shouldn't talk about that because it'll be out before this is published. Uh, and if that's the case, we'll put the link down here. The Got the spawn video, uh, should be finished now, uh, that talked about what I did last year and what's coming up this year and getting um, everything ready for the spawning that's coming up maybe soon and maybe in two months. Uh, but I'm, I'm doubling... I'm building this whole rack here so my life is a lot easier. So I'm very excited about that. We'll talk more about that. Evolution. As, as it's going because, uh, man, I want it to be easier than harder. So uh, other than that, um, there's some other things going on I can't talk about yet. So there. Well, that's boring. It Don't... is so boring, right? Yeah, it's boring to talk about things you can't talk about. It's such a tease. It's such a fucking bullshit social media tease. <laughs> I love it. Oh man, I got this crazy thing, but yeah, we can't talk about it. We can't talk. There's there's two things I can't talk about. Both of them are really exciting. I don't even. I just think had you, one. I don't think you even know about one of them. Probably not, because you know how stupid I am. I'll t I'll tell you about it afterwards, and then you can be like, "Oh damn, that's fucking stupid. No one cares, Rich." And number seven will surprise you. And <laughs> He's a righteous dude. A righteous dude. That's just me. Hey, Ben. Hey, Richard. Uh, uh, what's what's the sponsor that's been with us since the beginning? I'm 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 so hopped up on goofballs right now. I can't remember their name. I I'm channeling it. it it's coming in. It's saltwaterquame.com. Saltwaterquame.com. Why do you like him, Ben? Besides that, they're very nice to us. Well, because they have a multitude, a, a width and breadth of saltwater aquarium equipment and even livestock. And hey, I'm gonna we're gonna put some pictures right here because I saw on social media they were even in Florida collecting their own cleanup crew. Interesting. Yeah, they had cool photos of like the employee. How would you like to work somewhere where you like go for the day and collect stuff and the yeah. florida I, i've done that it's pretty cool very cool pretty but cool. uh anyways they have they've lots got a, of they've got an app that's yeah. pretty good and let me show you what i ordered i ordered from them recently on the app look oh look. my dude how could what yeah what is it it's that it's that uh pink fusion of purple helix um combo for um uh, uh, uh coralline algae now I think it's hit and miss with that product. We'll see. Uh, it's uh, it's not that expensive. It makes me feel good. I'm putting it in with the substrates I'm going to use for the spawning um, th that are cooking right now. So uh, it, uh, uh, it, I'm not totally endorsing the product, but it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's inexpensive enough, and there's been enough reports of it doing something for some people that I'm trying it out. I ordered it from saltwateraquarium.com. And I ordered it at 11 o'clock and they shipped it by one o'clock because they have 37,000 distribution centers just in California. Were you just, is, <laughs> they live, no matter where you live, there, there's somewhere next to you. 37,000, if you're in California. Yeah. So uh, check them out, saltwateraquarium.com for your saltwateraquarium.com needs. He's a righteous dude. A righteous dude. That's just me. Bada, 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 bada. Cool. All right. Now let's bring on our friend, Matt Wandell from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Welcome to Reef Beef. My name is Ben. My name is Richard. And today we have Matt Wandell on the show. Woo! 
and we are going to talk. Matt's going to talk about a mishap that he had using all for reef and how he navigated out of it. And he's going to talk about a low oxygen um, tank that he had something to do with and some deep water systems as well. And he's got a beef, but we'll get to that later. This show is brought to you by saltwateraquarium.com. It is powered by Polyp Lab and also brought to you by Champion Lighting and Supply. Matt, what is going on, my man? Nothing much, my brothers. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being on. It's been a bit, and we always love talking with you. Uh, it's funny talking with you online because it feels like we talk all the time. Uh, yeah. but, but you may just be a Russian bot online, and we're just talking to Vladimir. I I don't I don't go online. I have no idea what you're talking about. Fair enough, Vladimir. So <laughs> so Matt, you have a cool little yeah. reef tank, and um, you you're trying to take care of most of its you know mineral needs using Tropic Marin all for reef, which I use extensively as well. And you had like a little mishap with that and per perhaps right here um we'll show a picture of matt's reef tank currently but uh so tell yeah, us about cool. your little afr mishap and how you navigated out of it yeah um you know i was uh actually enticed into using afr because of some of the tanks i saw you running with it and um love the stuff and um uh, just made the dumbest mistake you could possibly make. The way I have it set up is that um, uh, 12 times a day, there's a little a little spurt of uh, AFR that goes into a tube. And then my deionized water, my top off, then comes on a couple minutes later and then flushes it in. It's two different dosing pumps. They're connected to the same bit of tubing, uh, basically to just kind of minimize how much plumbing I have. And um, in the course of doing some maintenance on those dosing pumps, I somehow accidentally swapped the DI one and the AFR one. So rather than two mils of AFR followed by a hundred mils of DI, it was the reverse of that <laughs> and, um, every hour or, and just or every people, two hours. Yeah. And just for people who don't know, um, uh, um, uh, what's it called when you jargon, uh, AFR is all for reef and it's a single, uh two part <laughs> so there's there's yeah. two two part additions for calcium and alkalinity and all for reef is a one part and um and in, so you just had instead of two mil of that going into your tank every how every once uh, 12 times a day you had yeah it was like every it, yeah it was like no it was like every two hours i think at that point i was at the in the neighborhood of like 15 mils a day in a 25 gallon tank which is you know the tank's just getting started up um it doesn't take much, right? In a in a twenty five gallon tank, I'm now up to like I think forty mils a day um, with much more demand. But it, it's a very small amount, right? Like that's not even a shot of liquid. And so basically, I I did the math. I think I was doing what I will call a, a centuple dose, meaning a hundred times more in a day than it needed. Um, yeah, just one of those completely stupid things. Um, and uh, it took me a couple of days to realize what was going on. I fortunately have a, you know, an automatic alkalinity tester. And that showed me the next morning that um, my alkalinity was like 14 or something like that. And I was like, oh my God, something's wrong here. And then what I thought would ha had happened was that maybe, you know, the, 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 the maintenance on the dosing pump was just cleared out some kind of obstruction. It took me another day to realize the real goof that I had made and that I was adding massive amounts. Um, so I started doing massive water changes. Of course, those didn't do anything because there was so much in the tank. And the the weird thing about it is the it's it's AFR is calcium formate, right? So um, it doesn't immediately change into alkalinity. It takes bacteria a day or two to convert that to alkalinity. So even though I was pulling all this stuff out, there was still a bunch of it left in the tank that was still converting to alkalinity. Um, it took me like a week to get back down to normal alkalinity levels, I think it was. Um, and I keep my alkalinity roughly between like eight and nine DKH. And it was like jumping up to 14, 15, uh, you know, do a massive water change. It would go back, it would come down and go back up. And it was, 
it was a wild ride. Um, had a bunch of acropora in the tank. Almost every coral bleached. Um, you know, my Montipora was the only thing that actually looked fine during this, which is just amazing to me. I don't know how any coral even survived it, but actually every coral I had survived it amazingly. Um, the acropora all went like ghost white, like no color at all. Um, and my, my, my basic strategy was to treat it almost like a bleaching event, like a high heat event. So I turned the lights way down low, like just enough light to, you know, that I would think would be enough for photosynthesis. Um, and that was it. And I fed the crap out of everything. I started dosing a lot of phytoplankton and oyster feces and stuff like that. And then everything survived was the wild thing. Um, to this day, all, you know, the coral started coloring back up after a couple of weeks and everything got through it. So. So, and you didn't, you didn't, so you didn't mess with anything else except for the alkalinity level. You didn't move. Coral no. Oh, and you turned the light off, but you didn't screw with well, it. You left everything and. Yeah, did, didn't turn the lights off, just turned them down. I think I turned them down to like, it's a radion that I currently have at like 80% of, you know, and I think I turned it down to like 20%, you know, just enough light to get some photosynthesis in there. Um, I didn't move anything around. You know, if it had been a calcwasser overdose or a, uh, you know, like a, a two-part overdose, I think I could have done some funny things with like hydrochloric acid maybe. Um, but the issue was that it was calcium formate and that stuff wouldn't have done anything because the other thing that it's dosing in there when you do the AFR is there's, there's strontium and there's magnesium and all these things that really the only way to deal with it all is just do massive water changes. Um, which is, uh, fortunately I have access to, you know, basically infinite seawater. Um, it's just really just a matter of, uh, uh, getting it all up to where the tank is, but, um, yeah, um, not a fun time, but. I was, I was actually amazed that it didn't kill everything. Um, the fish didn't care. Many of the corals didn't care. Softy. I, I do have one softy in there. Uh, Koji's pink Neftia coral that was completely unaffected. So weirdness, right? Huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It sounds like an example of what we talk about sometimes, which is if there's a problem, leave everything alone. You know, the more you screw with stuff, I mean, stressing a stressed animal stresses the animal, um, whereas removing the single stressor if, or the the multiple water quality stressors. I mean, if you had been, had your mat your hands on all those corals and moved them around, and they had to have new flow and new lighting and 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 touching, it's it seems to it's a mind story because how are we ever going to test that? But it seems to me if you got a problem don't do a million things like screwing with your coral. Um, just mess with your water quality and your light. Treating it like a bleaching event. I'm, I'm sure. Right on. Yeah. I'm sure I can repeat it again because I'm, I'm not very smart. So I'll probably do it again at some point in the future here. And then, and then I'll try something totally different and see how it all does. See, th that's why I never clean anything. I mean, and I guess we, <laughs> I guess we know that, that well, right. I mean, a, an out of whack alkalinity, is is not good but it's not as detrimental as an out of whack ph yeah so the the weird thing to me too was um so if i had overdosed say calcwasser um or like a two part a hundred times more than i would normally use in a day what i would expect to see is that calcium and alkalinity would shoot through the roof you'd get either a high pH, you'd get a high pH with calcwasser, of course, with two part, and with either one, I would expect you'd see a snowstorm, right? Where calcium and alkalinity would start to precipitate out as calcium carbonate, cause a snowstorm and actually cause it to crash. I never saw that. It was really weird. My DKH only got up to about, I think it was like 14 or 15 max, no matter what got dosed in. Um, and I didn't see a snowstorm. I didn't see calcium precipitating on my heater or my pumps or anything like that. So the weird thing is to me is like, where did it all go? Um, unfortunately, I really only had the ability to test for at that time for um, pH and alkalinity. I couldn't test for calcium. I just typically don't do that as part of my routine um, or any of those other cool things. So I don't really know what was going on, but I assume that much of it was staying as formate and not turning into alkalinity, but I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of uh, chemistry discussion, but I think that's what was going on.
How <laughs> how long had the tank been set up? Oh, at that point, I think it was about four months in or so, roughly. Yeah. And it's been, gosh, this happened in March. I can show you photos and videos of my tank later. Uh, but, you know, it's been, so what has that been now? Six months or something? Um, yeah. And everything seems to be thri thriving, so. Trippy, man. Sometimes tanks recover so well, and sometimes they really don't. And I'm trying to figure out what the through line might be. Yeah, I, I, you know, it might be like one of those things. I tend to think of it in my head is is almost like, uh, I mean, you're a scuba diver. You know how it is. Um, if one thing goes wrong, right, it's like, you'll be okay. If multiple things start going wrong, then you can have major problems, right? But it's like, yeah, yeah, it's the snowball effect. If, if, if you know, I also fucked up with my heater or something at the same time or, or, or the light, you know, I also raised the light or kept it. You know, it, it just, I guess it's kind of just knowing how to respond a little bit to disasters like that and knowing what to do and what not to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, it's like bleaching, you know, um, the, the reef will recover if it doesn't keep getting hit with heat and with other stressors. So, right. Right. Which, which sometimes those stressors are things you think you're helping it, but you're trying to, you know, if, Matt would have changed even more variables, you know, and the coral is like, look, just make it back the way it was before. Quit fucking with everything, you know. Oh, this right. would be this would be a, a great uh, time to use a product that I'm probably never going to make because it's just a joke and it's funny and uh, uh, no one will ever buy it. Although maybe they will. Uh, Reef SIBO. Uh, where it's just uh it's just di water in a bottle that says uh, that smells like something and it's got some colorant in it so it looks like you're adding something and it's the first thing you do if something goes wrong is add five drops per gallon and then Every don't do any them. yeah and then don't do anything for a week yeah which you know depending what it was that might just fix it yeah Kyle. Kyle came up with the the part of that that made me go, oh, that's how we could sell it. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it, that's the hardest thing in the world though, right? Is to go, is to think it through and go, all right, I'm going to treat it like a bleaching event. That means I turn down the lights and try to address the water quality problem with water changes and nothing else. Yes. He's a righteous dude. A righteous dude. That's just me. Bada, 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 bada. Champion Lighting and Supply. Okay. I got a box from Champion Lighting and Supply. What's in the box? What's in the box? Is it a head? In the box. It's Todd's it head. Oh, my God. This, which I can't tell you about. Oh, that's tons of fun, Richard. Yeah. Uh, This, which I can't tell you about. Oh, more. Bricks of gold. I like that. Um. They're packing material, which is old boxes. Oh, it looks like seaweed. Ground up, which I think is the best thing in the world. But um, there's some um, there's some reef lab stuff that they sent me. They've got some test kits, a magnesium test kit, uh, and a um, alkalinity test kit, which I will actually be trying because I like alkalinity. Calcium test kit. And here, the smart feeder. This is the thing that we want to get into your hands, Ben. It's uh, it's a lot like another feeder that we like on the market, uh -huh. uh, but it's by Reef Factory and it works with their app. And I'll tell you, I like their app a lot. I, I really, I'm, I'm enjoying all the stuff I'm doing with um, Reef Labs, Reef Factory, excuse me, Reef Factory that I can't tell you about. So, so there you go. I think you should try it because I think you will like it. Reef Factory, I believe, is from Poland. Thank you, Ben, for that bit of information. <laughs> That's my Poland, concrete. which is famous for being close to the ocean. Yes, Ocean Poland. Ocean. So uh, that's it. Check out Champion Lighting at championlighting.com, Champion Lighting and Supply. Um, yeah, we like Todd a lot. Todd's pretty, Todd's the real deal. So uh, check him out and go get stuff. Todd from Todd. He's a righteous dude. A righteous dude. This is me. Matt, where you work, you have a crazy, crazy display that is low oxygen. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I guess now would be a good time when you're when you're editing this to post uh, some photos or videos that the Monterey Bay Aquarium has of uh, some of our deep sea animals. Um, yeah, so we opened a uh, deep sea exhibit uh, last year. Gosh, was it last year? Yeah, it was last year. Gosh, time flies. It was like spring of last year, um, showcasing animals from the deep sea. Super proud of it. Um, some of the animals we collected with um, ROVs. We have our we have a couple ROVs that we have access to with our sister organization, um, and those can go down to like uh, a few thousand meters under the ocean, collect animals very carefully. And some of those animals, you know, you, you get around here in Monterey Bay. There's an interesting phenomenon that that happens where um, you get down to like uh, roughly 500 to 700 meters down, right? And the oxygen gets so low, they call it the oxygen minimum zone. It hits a, it hits something like 5% saturation, right? So um, typically our reef tanks are at like 100%. Um, and, and this is like much, much lower. There's a lot of cool animals that are found there that seem to really thrive in that zone. And what we found is that um, they don't just tolerate that low oxygen they actually require it um and so to keep them alive we basically lower the oxygen in the seawater it's a little bit it was an interesting process too because one developing doing the r d developing the technology to lower oxygen in a, in a in an aquarium which nobody had really done before um and then also it leads to some counterintuitive things we're so used to building aquariums to increase gas exchange uh, increase the amount of oxygen that's in the water um, by opening up lids and having protein skimmers and things like this, having, um, you, you know, you want the water to splash in your reservoir and stuff like that. We sort of had to reverse all those assumptions about how things work. Um, and it took a, a while because so much of this counterintuitive. Um, so all the aquariums are all sealed up. Um, we have boat hatches that allow for easy access to them to do um, feeding and cleaning and stuff like that. Um and it's basically using a pretty established technology uh, that's made by 3M. It's called a Liquicell, which is a it's it's in a canister. It looks like a it looks like a filter, almost like a filter um, that you you know like a canister filter, uh, like a sediment filter. But inside of it, it's got a semi permeable membrane. It looks like a bunch of these like thousands of these little straws, right? And water goes through those straws, and the straws are actually. Um, a semi-permeable membrane, they're, they're hydrophobic, right? So on one side of the membrane, you have seawater, and on the other side, you have a vacuum. And what it's doing is pulling out dissolved gas out of the seawater. So you can think of it a little bit, you know, an RO membrane is a semi-permeable membrane. It's pulling, you know, it's allowing ions through, or excuse me, it's allowing water molecules through, but not the ions, right? And it's stripping out most, so you get like mostly pure water on one side. This one, it's a gas on one side and water on the other, not water and water. Um, it's like an RO membrane no, 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 go ahead. separating gas from, like all all gases, oxygen, nitrogen, all all that. Yeah, that, that's the thing. So it's removing all gases. Um, we can help it along to sort of prefer to take oxygen out. We use what's called a sweet gas, which is pure nitrogen which is basically helping uh, that that surface right near the membrane be mostly nitrogen. So that way there's more of an affinity for the oxygen molecules to come out, if that makes sense. Um, but it does pull out nitrogen. It does pull out CO2 as well. So it becomes this interesting chemistry experiment because you're pulling CO2 out of the seawater as well, quite efficiently. And what does that do that causes the pH to go up, right? Um, deep sea water typically has a much lower pH than at the surface, somewhere around, you know, seven, 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 eight, maybe even lower sometimes. Um, so you have to add CO2 back in to the system as well, <laughs> um, post degassing, right? So Weird. this process is happening c continuously and these thousands of little tiny straws have a, um, produce a high head. They, they produce a lot of back pressure. So we have to have pretty high head pumps to do this. That's eating, adding heat to the system. It's a deep sea tank. It has to be cold. So there's just a lot of things you're juggling there. Um, it's also just producing a lot of water motion in the reservoir, which is also, if you don't deal with it correctly, um, creating gas exchange. You really want to have all your water surfaces be completely still. Um, 
and that's how we do it. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting process. Um, and doing that, all that allows us to basically keep animals that, um, you know, haven't been on display anywhere else in the world. Um, except for, for except for here so it's been pretty hey, cool man let me ask you two questions so mm -hmm. so one is y'all were the y'all were the first place ever to do that no one's ever even attempted that uh not as far as we know um other people have used these with seawater for very short-term experiments like they'll take a comb jelly and stick it in a jar that they've pulled the oxygen out of for you know a few hours, a few days or whatever to see how much oxygen it uses at low oxygen concentrations. Um, and it's also used, but, but those were always like temporary, very temporary setups by researchers. Um, it's also used, I don't quite understand all the industry uses for it, but it's used to degas liquids for things like making computer chips, as far as I understand. Um, this is the first example of somebody using it for an aquarium that's like for a public display um and the challenge there is these membranes are you can imagine something that allows a gas molecule through but not water um they're very 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 fine pores right um and so they can easily get clogged by things like bacteria and stuff like that we have to filter the water with uh micron filters to very very fine amounts before we enter before it enters that membrane or else it'll get clogged up really fast we have two, we have duplicate membranes going um, so that we can switch to one or the other at all times and then clean the other one. Um, there's redundant systems that way. So um, yeah, we, we, as far as we know, nobody's ever done it before. It's crazy. So then the second thing I'm thinking, like I was thinking like total recall, like some habitation on Mars where it's like, Oh, cool. They're on Mars. But like the whole system is so fraught with, so many things that could go wrong like i i guess what i'm saying is like is that obviously that exhibits doing fine but it hasn't been a nightmare of things going wrong um no not really um you know we we had a lot of years before we did develop any exhibit we have years of r d that we do um and we had a lot of hiccups sort of behind the scenes before anybody could see it a lot of experience with all the different components of it the, nit the nitrogen generation the vacuum pumps, um, the membranes themselves and pre-filters and how often those would need to be changed um, to sort of be able to dial it in and design all these uh, uh, exhibits um, and, 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 and ways of, of uh, sealing up the tanks and sealing up the reservoirs. And even just things as simple as like an overflow, right? It seems like a very simple idea, right? Water, gravity falls down to the reservoir. Simple, right? Well, when it does that, it's actually pulling air with it. Um, and in that process, it's, it's got to pull air from somewhere and then it bubbles it out into the sump. So keeping, making sure that that stays a closed loop and stuff like that. Um, I will say that it was a ton of work to get it running. We ran into hiccups. We basically had to convert a lot of our building into, you know, massive ma vacuum pumps over in this part of the building, big nitrogen generators over on this side of the building, getting all that to work out was definitely had some challenges. Um, and dialing everything in takes quite a bit of tinkering, lots of sensors. There's lots of points to fail, right? Um, and it is quite a bit of maintenance, but, um, you know, we have people here 24 seven experts in life support design. So we make it all work. Um, uh, but Wait. it's, it, it is, a, it's, a, it's a ton of work. <laughs> how, how does the nitrogen cycle, how does breaking down the waste, how does that work in a system like that? So, yeah, so one of the fortunate things is we have open systems here. So water is constantly going in and constantly uh, leaving. Okay. Um, so we don't really have to cycle them in, in the in the normal way. Um, we can pretty much right away put animals in within reason. I mean, we usually cycle. We usually will flush systems for like a week, um, you know, just to get any kind of nasties out, residues, whatever. Um, and then there isn't much ammonia production because of the low oxygen oh. because we put very, very little food in. It's so cold. Um, we do trickle in new water at a very slow rate because all that new water has a lot of oxygen in it. Right. So you, yeah. you, you're just, you're just, uh, it's counterintuitive. So we, we do flush the system usually something like once per day. So it's really just like a trickle of water. And that flushes out any, you know, kind of waste products, basically, that are building up. What, so. what, uh, and then we don't, we don't have to deal with salinity or anything like that. So, 
what what uh, species of fish are these? Uh, it's mostly not. Well, we do have one fish. There's a fish called a snakehead eel pout, um, which we found does best in low oxygen. We have some benthic animals. We have these animals called brisingid fire stars. It's a type of sea star that both requires low oxygen and requires to never uh, be seen by the sun, basically never be exposed to the sun. We found out even for just a few, even for just a few seconds. Um, that's its own story. But um, most of our low oxygen exhibits are uh, for what we call midwater animals. So jellies, comb jellies, um, uh, siphonophores, uh, you know, Portuguese man of war is a type of siphonophore, but these are deeper, deeper, much deeper animals. Um, and in a lot of cases, we're culturing those um, because of the, uh, what, the ability we have to provide the low oxygen. Um, yeah. And um, in most cases, we are like feeding them live foods. Um, in some cases, they're, you know, the tina fours in particular, comb jellies, they really like to eat larval fish. So we're culturing fish and then we actually hand feed them, you know, two fingers in 40 degree water and carefully hand feed each one. What's um, the temperature? So there's not a lot of, you know, uneaten food playing on the bone. About 40 degrees Fahrenheit in most cases. Damn. Yeah. It, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, it, it's painful on your skin, um, you and you can't really do neoprene gloves because you won't be able to do that delicate stuff, right? So a lot of times the folks will wear like a neoprene sleeve um, to at least protect their forearm. But yeah, it's it's tough stuff. When I was at the Houston Zoo, I used to be in charge. One of the things I was in charge of was like a cold water, um, uh, like Pacific Northwest, uh, like touch tank. And I used to have to work on it a lot I don't remember. I think it was in the upper forties though, but I just, I definitely remember stinging hands. Yeah, man, it doesn't feel good. The The coldest tank we have, there's some benthic tanks that we have with some corals and stuff. Those are 38. And I will say there's a difference you can feel between 38 and 42. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it hurts. He's a righteous dude. A righteous dude. That's just me. Bada, 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 bada. Hey, right. Richard. Ben! What does it feel like to be powered by Polyp Lab? Feels like a thousand nice feathers gently or hardly massaging you in the way you like. That's what it feels like. Uh, this week, we're talking about from Polyp Lab, this thing here. This is the Genesis block. And the reason I'm talking about it is because Fahad, one of our beefers, asked me to send him one of these from my system. So um, I've got one ready to send out that's all covered in coralline algae. And it's got bacteria and stuff inside like it's supposed to be. Should ship really easy. It's not going to break up. Ow, God, that really hurts. Um, it's not going to break up in shipping. Uh, and I think that's a great way to inoculate tanks. I can scrape everything obvious off of it and send it out. So, uh, Richard, I love those very much because early on, uh, Polyp Lab had sent me a couple of those, four of them. I I keep them in a reef tank. That, now they've been in this reef tank for like a year and a half. And that's how I inoculate every single new client. So check them out wherever things are sold for your reef tank. Uh, and we're happy to continually being powered by Polyp Lab. He's a righteous dude. A righteous dude. This is me. Bada, 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 bada. I'm, uh, I'm looking at my pictures of when I went down to see this exhibit and you showed me around. And uh, man, it's awesome exhibit. And the plumbing for the system. Um, uh, so, so my plumbing is just get it done, right? Um, Matt's plumbing is always make it pretty and make it nice. The plumbing on this exhibit is exact and massive. There is so much going on. And uh, it definitely seems like the right time to care about everything being in the right place. Um, this is not, uh, in the one sense, it seems like it's easy because you know exactly what you're trying to accomplish and how to do it. And the other sense, you need all, you know, just walls filled with, with plumbing going every which way to make everything that needs to get wherever it needs to get, get there. It's really impressive. I, uh, 
I suggest everyone goes and looks at this exhibit. These are animals that um, it's against nature for us to see. Um, <laughs> so you should go see them because they're badass. No, I mean, that that what Richard just said, that makes me think like there's certain, you know, maybe plants and animals and whatnot that like just you're not going to see unless you're in a rover. And that's, you know, that's not very many people. So it's like weird to do. I wonder whatever what other scenarios are like, you know, maybe like polar bears on exhibit or something like that. Like, you, you know, a lot of work to to get some sort of animal on display that normally you wouldn't be able to see. Well, I remember being on the on the Carson with you and looking at the the green line of the oxygen zone um, just becoming nothing and uh yeah. just going how is anything alive down here and now it's like six years later you've got this whole exhibit just badass man congratulations to the, everyone yeah it's uh and by no means is it uh you know i, I just kind of sit back and ask people to do things i'm not even building most of this stuff to be honest it's a whole team of people uh, I'm fortunate just to be able to observe most of it happening. Um, I helped with some little things, but it's mostly just a bunch of work by our aquarists. They're amazing at what they do. Um, and our life support designers um, with some help from me, just managing some parts. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I got to say, you know, one thing I'll say to people when, when we look at, um, for example, we have one animal called a bloody, bloody belly comb jelly. Um, and when you're looking at it, <laughs> you're the only humans on the planet looking at that animal. And that's like almost a certainty. Yeah. Um, there's no way anybody else is seeing it because it's not in any other aquarium and there's nobody seeing it in the wild either, unless they happen to be in a submarine at that moment. Um, so it's just kind of neat to be able to, to see things like that in person, not in a video and almost be able to touch it, right? It just gives you so much better experience than just, you know, watching it on a TV screen. Yeah, you would think, I mean, eventually some other public aquarium is going to want to duplicate that sort of thing but it's probably probably so many details yeah and i mean we we've basically made it open source if anybody who wants to can copy what we've done um it requires i would say tremendous resources you know money basically to do it um you know these animals you can't just you can't just put a trap in the ocean and collect them they, they are only found deep down and they're super delicate. The comb jellies are basically like tissue paper in water. I mean, you can't touch them. Um, and so you really need an ROV to be able to do it. Um, you ba you maybe don't need the big, huge ROVs like we have. Um, you could maybe do it with like a mini ROV. Um, but finding them, collecting them, getting the systems all built up for them, it just costs a lot of money, honestly. Um, but yeah, there's, there's really no reason nobody else couldn't do it. Well, it, it's funny because Monterey Bay Aquarium has got a history of stuff like that, right? The cephalopod exhibit, anyone could do, just no one bothers because of what it takes in in money and resources to do it, which is really just money. Resources are just money. It's all the same thing, right? And then like before that was the, you know, the the bay tank, the big, the big tuna tank. Um, and, you know, before that was the roundabout and it just kind of goes back and back and back of Monterey going, well, hell, we're going to do, we're just going to do it because it's cool. Um, and that's so inspiring and awesome and amazing and fabulous. I just, it's just, it gives me the willies in a good way. Yes. Yeah, so, and so the, the, the story that always gets told too in that vein is jellies because, right. you know, there, there's a huge, there's a huge jelly exhibit in Monterey Bay Aquarium that um, was built, I want to say in the late nineties. And at the time now, Jellies are everywhere, right? Everybody thinks jellies are awesome. They're screensavers. They're so cool. Can't imagine an aquarium without having a few jellies. But back then, people would say, oh, crowds won't like jellies. I mean, what do people want when they come to aquariums? They want penguins, seahorses, sharks. Um, and jellies were a big gamble. Um, and sometimes you don't know what people are going to like until you do it, um, right? So, so that's that's something that we have to have in the back of our minds. Like just because there's no crowds clamoring for it um, doesn't mean, you know, we shouldn't do it. Um, what's the old saying, right? If you ask people in the 1890s, if they would, you know, they'd ask for a faster horse or something like that. They, they didn't know they needed cars yet. And then they did, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It's, that might be a terrible analogy. <laughs> we're, we're all about terrible analogies. Uh, I, I love that, 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 
jellyfish jellies i'm sorry have become so ubiquitous in the aquarium world because of the work your institution did in the 90s that i didn't even think to put them on that list right right They're right just... right yeah which is yeah and it's uh it's uh there's a number of aquariums in japan too that i think kind of pioneered that effort back then um monterey bay aquarium wasn't the first to do jellies not not trying to make that claim but um yeah at least here in the states like it was a it was a very new thing that nobody was sure if it would work or not and then they just went whole hog with it and built a whole exhibit for them you know and it, and it turned out great so yeah Im impossible unless you give them just give them what they need oh just give them what they need you know yeah <laughs> what's it take to so keep easy. those alive oh, it takes whatever they need yeah you know whatever whatever they need yeah so matt you you had a you have a beef that's the whole well, it's never happened to me, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm pissed. No, I'm not really pissed. Um, no, it's uh, you know, it, it started about this this whole conversation around palytoxin, palytho, oh. and it's been, this conversation has been going on for years, right? I mean, I remember I got hit with some palytho poisoning. Uh, uh, gosh, it would have been oh, like ten years ago. Yeah. Um, in a stupid way. And I was aware of the risk. I bleached the tank. I thought I had detoxified it all, but clearly didn't. Um, but yeah, the, the gist of it is um, the, the argument I see, you know, people will bring it up every once in a while and say these corals are dangerous and, and, and people will say like, Oh, you know, you're overestimating it or you're, you're, it's fear mongering, whatever. I've been working with Palithoa for years and years and years. I've never been hit. Therefore it's not a problem. And to me, it's the it's the failure in logic there of it hasn't personally affected me, so must be fine, right? It's like, and to me, it's like, uh, hey, you know, I drive around without a seatbelt all the time, and I've never been in an accident, so it's fine to not wear your seatbelt. It's like, ugh, come on, um, I, I, I have it's, sex it's, without a it's, it's it's a lack of empathy in a, in a sense, right? Yeah, I have sex all the time without a condom. I've never gotten an STD or gotten anybody pregnant. So right. go for it. Right, 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 right. Right. Yeah, exactly. I jump out of airplanes without a parachute all the time and I'm fine. Man, for for me, it is definitely, I know without a shadow of a doubt, and I've called them out before, but it is Captain Jerk Pallies. Have my number. It's Captain Jerkus. Pally Captain, Pally Captain Jerkus. Captainus Jerkicus. I was thinking about something related to this, which is, how much time and effort it takes to get somebody on board with something. So even, even, even like to walk through some a mind story that somebody has and to get them off the mind story is so much work. You can't just say that's a mind story. Don't believe it anymore. Most of the time they, because people's brains have to go through the whole pachinko of, of making it of undoing the mind story. And I, I guess it is, I guess, I, I, you know, I've never, I don't wear a seatbelt and I've never gotten in a, I've never been killed in a car is a mind story. And you unraveling it is friggin' hard and takes time and time and time. And I think people get frustrated with that because they think you could just tell someone who's telling you a mind story and they'll just understand that it's a mind story. And uh, it doesn't work like, like that. I mean, how long have we been talking about palithoa poisoning you know 20 30 years well this can also be applied to in my line of work i had not too long ago you know i i tell people all the time when i meet them they're new whatever and like oh should i can i put this in my tank Can I put that in my tank you know do you have any sort of quarantine or observation no i just put them in right away it's this, I even had a blow up on Facebook about it where I just sort of bitched and moaned at, on Facebook because I can't do that in front of clients or potential clients. So I directed that energy towards Facebook of just like I tell people over and over again, get some kind of, you, you don't have to be some QT wizard, you know, just get an observation tank. But no, this guy killed like several thousand dollars worth of stuff. And it's like, uh, you know, you know, telling them like, oh, should I get this soul hold tank? No, man, like you don't know. You already have this Achilles tang and this and that. And you're good. You could introduce, you know, marine velvet or Lord knows what. Oh, it's and he said that is what well, hadn't happened yet to me. So I, I feel like I'm lucky. And he chuckled. 
And it's like, he pissed me off so bad. I took the dude out of my phone. I don't answer my phone to this person anymore. It's so funny because there's so many, once you know stuff, something, and it makes sense and you feel like it's been supported. It's so obvious, right? So I know somebody who had a soul hole tang in their reef and I was like, you don't want that fish in your reef. And they're like, it'll be fine. You know, and then six months later, oh, this was terrible. You know, or or um, the yellow uh, Diogorgia, um, uh, you know, that, that lasts between six months and a year or the blueberry Gorgonian or tunicates or, uh, um, Flame or, scallop. Or, 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 or crinoids or or feeding yeah. bait brine shrimp to cephalopods you know it's Those like fancy nudibranx we we know you're right we kind of it's like we've seen this enough time knowing that you know i'm just going to add more reef nutrition foods which are great foods is probably not what they need we're not really sure um so so and the same with palithoa right people are going to palithoa and i'm I don't know what to do because people don't like to be, you know, challenged in that way. So I, I just kind of go, well, yeah, you know, well, enjoy the, enjoy those animals while you got them. You know, I can't, there's nothing I can say that's going to convince somebody not to do it. So I don't, if we get back to Palithoa, I don't know what to, you know, what do you think Matt should be done? What, I mean, yeah. Yeah. That's a question. I mean, just I, I think talking about it is always good, right? Just education, um, at least making a warning about it. I mean, who knows? Fish stores could it's it's certainly possible that there's fish stores out there that just simply don't even know until you educate. Oh, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with telling people all the time. And if they get tired of hearing about it, well, tough. I mean, there's speed limit signs every mile on the freeway for a reason, right? You, you know what it is, but it's good to be reminded for people who are new to it and don't know what it is already. Um one thing that I think is uh, worth bringing up too is that, um, and and I want to say this was, oh gosh, I forget his name. I want to say it was Pearson on the on the Reef Beef Discord. I, I could have the name totally wrong, but I want to give him credit for them credit for for saying that that palithoa poisoning. Also, people who say I have been poisoned by palithoa might be a mind story too, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff in reef aquariums, and and as they pointed out, there's a lot of stuff in aquariums that besides palithoa that is toxic. Um, you know, there's certain lots of terp terpenoids produced by soft corals, um, countless number of them that that are Vibrium. toxic. I mean, they're using these to to fight with each other. Yeah, and 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 besides that, you know, you got vibrio, microbacterium, um, all these things, just bacteria, but also toxins that could be affecting you. I mean, we've heard stories about people that. Um, we'll cut a soft coral with a scalpel, put that scalpel in their mouth, and then their mouth goes oh. numb and stuff. So, First of all, dude, it, if, you, dude, if you're cutting yeah. some of the scalpel and putting your mouth yeah. from the fuck on. Yeah, I mean, kind of absentmindedly, right? Um, and so like just saying, head. like, like th there's other stuff. Just because you have palypho, don't have palypho in your tank, doesn't mean you're like, oh, just go hog wild with ripping stuff apart and everything. Um, you know, sponges have toxins. Lots of stuff has toxins. They're 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 wild animals. They defend themselves. And um, in addition, yeah, as I know, I've gotten a mycobacterium infection in my finger. It's good to wash your hands after you stick them in your tank. It's good to you know just be aware of some of the dangers there. Um, and vibrio can be a nasty infection, man. It'll spread fast. Um, so yeah, just just things to be aware of for everyone. Yeah, it's it's great to be skeptical about shit like. You know, I and we talked, and it was great discussion on the Discord because it was like, I have we seen people claiming that it was um poly toxin issues that that wasn't compelling, right? And we talk a lot about correlation does not equal causation, but I think we've seen a lot of correlation between. I chopped up pallies and got really sick, or I boiled a rock yep. with pallies and got really sick, or, you know, I, this is the fourth time I've gotten really sick after fucking with these corals in this particular tank. Yeah. I, we, we know I'm talking about you, Ben. Um, it's uh, so, so th I, I think that's cool. I think it's a great discussion and I'm really glad we have that on the discord because it's where the rubber meets the road of compelling evidence versus skepticism. And, and how that kind of transitions back and forth between the two. 
So, you know, yeah. I and I thought that discussion was great, you know, with Pearson coming back and saying, yeah, you know, right, I was in a bad mood and I may have overstated that case. And then you were going, yeah, but it's a really important point to point out that lots of shit in your tank's going to fuck you up. So the protocols that you use or could fuck you up, the protocols you use for pallies are no really are not really that different than for anything else. You know, don't. Yeah. You know, if yeah. I'm messing with corals, I am not putting these near my face or my eyes or my mouth or anything, you know, Be you careful. know, yeah. but OK, sort of counterpoint. OK, sort of counterpoint. This all makes my head spin when I think that this is what I do for a living. And I'm not I mean, I, I want to be trust me, I want to be more careful, but I'm just not. And but then my question is, is it just that the chances or are low or what are the chances that like I've. I, I, I'm somewhat immune to some of these things. Is that a possibility or no? I don't think anybody knows for sure, right? Um, and certainly people can develop um, worse reactions to things. Um, just one example, it's, you know, it's kind of a tangent, but uh, we had an aquarist at Steinhardt that um, she would became very sensitive to the stings of upside down jellies, Cassiopeia, which, dude, you can run your hand right across a field of Cassiopeia and not even feel a thing. They have the weakest sting you could possibly imagine. Um, but she had been working with jellies for years and years and years, and eventually it got stronger and stronger reaction to them to where she couldn't even put her hand in the tank without even touching them, just her hand in the water without it, you know, developing this red, red rash everywhere. So it's certainly possible that people are getting more, re more reactive to the toxin. I have no idea. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, but it certainly seems reasonable. Um, and that's, that's so weird though, because you hear about, there's other things in nature where you know, you could, uh, I don't know if this is bullshit or not, but it seems like I've known someone that like you could get bit by a snake a lot of times and it doesn't have a, as much of effect. There's some cases of over time with more exposure to it, that it is less effective right. to you, but then there's other things that over time are more effective to you. Sure. Like alcohol, right? The more you drink, the more you have a yeah. tolerance for it. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about palytoxin itself to to know. And it, maybe it's possible that both situations can happen. I don't know. I think though, just wanted to say, people who maybe are are calling it fear mongering or whatever, or uh, you know, oh, it's not going to kill you, whatever that kind of stuff, um, which is probably true. I mean, unless you really manhandle it, you're not. It's not going to kill you. Um, I would encourage anybody who 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 is a doubter of that. Of, of the of the danger of it to watch the video of julian at i want to say it was a, at a macna if you just google julian sprung palytoxin palythoa macna whatever it's a great talk he did um and i want to say it's like a 10 or 15 minute story but it's very worth watching we actually include that video as part of our training um, for volunteers and for aquarists here who are going to work in any tank that has palythoa in it. We've since removed all the palythoa from our tanks um, because of the dangers of it, but we had some, and when we did, we made them watch that video before they ever worked with the tanks. Julian is, you know, I feel like I'm lucky to know the guy, um, to know somebody as brilliant as he is. He's a very smart guy, very well educated on these topics. He's not he's not doing things and 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 making terrible assumptions. And he uh, you know, just moved a colony of palythoa from one tank to another. He didn't rip it apart. He didn't yank polyps in half or anything like that. He simply moved it from one tank to another in a cup underwater, uh, treated it gently, and it made him very, very sick. It killed a bunch of his corals, um, and he was quite certain that it was the palythoa that did it. And he didn't have any noticeable cuts or anything in his hand. Maybe he had some small cuts that it went into, but we all have small cuts on our hands pretty much at any given moment, right? So it's like, if Ju if it can happen to Julian and wipe him out, um, you know, that makes me worry a little bit, right? Yeah, right there. There you go. Yeah, we'll link that video down below. I'll find it and we'll have it linked. And Ben, to your yeah. point about are you lucky or whatever, that's kind of what 
brought up when I posted, you know, if we found out somebody died from poly poisoning, we wouldn't be surprised. If uh -huh. if we found out that you were feeling really sick and then died and it was poly poisoning, we would be very sad, but it would be like, yeah, I can totally see that. Yeah, That's that totally... yeah, that checks out. <laughs> yeah, it's it would be, it would not shock anybody. And, and just me... the fact, just the okay. fact that that would not shock anybody, is bad. Is is should tell us something about what we think about poly poisoning. Um, and Ben, Ben, do you think it's getting worse or getting better each time you get hit? Like not better, but you know what I mean, more tolerant or what? So mine was from the same tank and was five times over the course of probably two years and now so the you asked me a question is it getting worse i don't i don't think it is but it it has felt and come on the exact same way every single time and and i for mine i would that's what i was going to say earlier i wanted to say this on the show because i know i've said this in discord but i have since sort of understood what is happening to me because i was doing all this you know it was different ways i was doing fftasia one time uh one time i uh so stupid but one time i was digging at them with a dental tool uh one time i had gloves on one time i didn't one time this one time that but so what happens is i i had the skimmer running and i'm pretty damn sure that the skimmer was aerosolizing palytoxin on little tiny droplets and i was breathing that in because all five times you know i i work in the day and then i come home and and late at night it feels like i'm starting to get a cold in my upper nasal and then it goes real fast and i start getting chills i don't get the chills until i would go to bed and the chills wake me up and then the first time this ever happened was when covid was new and i thought it was covid because I was having a hard time pulling in full breaths. It felt like something was sitting on my chest and it hurt. And, and my God, all, all five of those times, like I had a mountain of blankets on me and was shivering. Like my body had completely lost its ability to self-regulate its temperature. And, and I was just freezing to death. Like I was in the Arctic. So in the whole thing takes like maybe four hours and then it's gone. But and then the next day you're exhausted because your body was doing those shivers. So, you know, you're sore and it's just a or so where I'm at now is they're fucking growing in that guy's tank. And it's like they're fucking they're going and it's one of my best tanks. And and I now I'm so scared of them that it's like, I don't know what the fuck to do with them now. Hmm. This is like this is like the Scoville scale or the guy who gets himself stung by stuff. The Johnson scale of how bad Pally Thor are gonna fuck you up. It's always a five. It's always the same number. Yes. I'm I'm trying not to go for six, but by God, I need the fucking things out of there. Well, we were talking about that uh on the Discord about you know, scraping them from the back. You 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 should be able to use a can scraper and get them off the glass pretty quick and get them out and then get the hell out of there. Um, yeah. You know, cause we know that these are nasty um, or just do like two at a time when, as you're leaving every time you're there. And maybe one of those VOC masks, definitely turn off the skimmer, make it the very last thing that I do, you know, or, or just hire some kid who doesn't know what they're doing to do it for you. <laughs> just say, Hey, lick those off I... of the back there. <laughs> I, I think the hobby could really benefit from, uh, and I know that these are out there. Uh, who was it? Was it Joe Caparata from Unique Corals? There, there's got to be a snail or a nudibranch that eats Palithoa, right? I mean, it I has to some exist. Some people were otherwise. saying there was some type of crab, Matt. I think it was a crab. Mm, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I hadn't heard about a crab, but I thought it was Joe who said this. I, I can't remember what the heck they're called. I'm sure Julian can pull right. it off the top of his head, but it's like, holy cow. And, and the, he was saying that they like, are are plucking them off of wild you know maricultured colonies or, or whatever and it's like holy cow like please save those <laughs> please I mean, save 50 those bucks. 50 bucks yeah like and, and and those those could be rented out and passed along like a rental car or something you know you you have them eat all your polyps you you give them back to unique corals or whatever or you you know you free cycle them or, or whatever to a, to the next person um I, in the past i would have bought those in a heartbeat um and we were trying to get rid of them here we had a whole 
it was a big deal to get rid of all our palitoa. Um, we couldn't just toss them in the garbage either. Um, you know, we had to treat them as hazardous waste and all this other stuff. It was a nightmare. Um, but for, yeah, somebody at home is trying to get rid of them and, and, and is worried about it. It'd be great if there was a biological control, right? If anybody knows what Matt's talking about or a link to it, let us know. <laughs> Cause I'll, 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 I, I wrote it down to do a search for it. That'd be great. Um, but if you know it, let me know because that would be easier than uh, hoping. Um, you know, I, 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 I have pallies and I've been getting rid of them as I can. I, I put some of that stacks rock on top of them, let them grow on it and then get, then toss them. And usually I toss them and pour bleach on them. I, you know, they, they stay underwater, a lot of ventilation going where my tank is. I do it the last thing I'm working on and I take them in the water and then I pour bleach in the water with them and then I toss them. And, um, Last week I did that and I tossed them in the trash can and didn't bleach them. I just spaced on the bleaching. The next day I opened that can and threw some stuff away. And then about an hour, three hours later, I was not feeling right. And, you? And yeah, yeah. And I have, I have no idea. It, it wasn't enough for me to know if that, if correlation is causation there or not. Um, Cause I didn't get sick enough. And as soon as I felt sick, I immediately got super hypochondriac. And it was like, all I can think of was pally poisoning. Um, and I had been exhausted and there was other things going on. Um, it was just cancer. But yeah, it was probably just face cancer. All of this really confirms a point that I've made for years now, which is fish tanks are stupid. Yeah, fish tanks are stupid. <laughs> uh, everyone should get rid of them. Uh, just let yeah. Monterey Bay Aquarium show these animals. What are you doing? Yeah, just get rid of them all. They're terrible. It, it took this yeah. many episodes for us to say just like quit, <laughs> quit doing aquariums. <laughs> I and swinging on that note, Matt, we're gonna let you go. Thank you so much for being on here and for sharing all that kind of stuff and having a beef. It's so great, man. You guys comes on with a real beef. Thanks for having me, you guys. I really appreciate what you're doing for the hobby. Um, love listening to your show. And um, I guess now is when you'll start talking shit about me after I leave. Huh? Nah, we'll yeah. talk shit to you right in front of your face. Yeah, yeah usually. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Goddamn giant. The, <laughs> the entire next episode will be a beef about the last guest you had. That <laughs> fucking asshole. So, right yeah. on, okay. Dude. Thanks for, thanks for having me, you guys. Really appreciate it. Dig it, baby. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that was Matt Wandell talking about Matt Wandell stuff. So uh, thank you guys for listening. This episode is uh, brought to you by saltwateraquarium.com, Champion Lighting and Supply, and powered by Polyp Lab. Peace. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, that if you have hair on your head, it will still grow other places on your body if they don't compete that way. Bloopers for bloopers. Check this and that. Okay, and that goes away, and that goes away. And should I be wearing some stupid hat? If you got one on this podcast, we sometimes cuss, and uh, if that's going to make you feel bad, then you know, just. Just understand that's what's going to happen. Why don't right. you do that a third time just for fun? Tell them to just go, yeah. <laughs> just go away. Just go away if you don't like it. Man, yeah, just go away. We cuss a little bit. If you don't like it, just go away. Yeah, we're, we're punk rock, not in the Sid and Nancy version where we'll like stab you and do heroin in our eyes and puke all over thing and destroy everything, but more, you know, in the uh, in the kind of uh, Husker do kind of way. What's this, going on? This, this is, is reef, reef beef. beef. This is reef beef. This is reef beef. No, this is reef beef. Okay, I believe you. You know what, Richard, one day you and I will get to where we... 
finish finishing each other's sentences. sentences. But... Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I gave you an opportunity. You devil. Come on now. You horny devil. You you horny horny man. You cisgendered cephalopod keeping. Is this just me? I'm just it's just me now. Reef beef. Oh shit. No, here he comes. Ben beef. Yeah. Ben beef. Just, and, just and beef. We'll, and then we'll talk some shit if you've got time. Okay. Yeah. Um damn it. You can't do that. Here, start over. Start over, god damn it. We're doing it live. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe maybe you are just stupid. Yes, <laughs> I've been trying to tell you in not so subtle ways. Okay, I believe you now. Oh, you tricked me, you motherfucker! I didn't trick you at all, you poopy dupe. It was word association. I called you a motherfucker, and you called me a poopy dupe. Yeah, we got to do a a show where we um use the most benign uh swear words. Yeah, um, yeah, because because in the beginning we warned people, and they were like, "Hey, you dummy cuckoo." Yeah, hey, oh, beans and rice. <laughs> you could stop listening right now.